We're gonna deep dive into three key areas, interoperability, usability, and cybersecurity. Now, before we start though, I wanna briefly tell you about Current Health so you understand our role in empowering health or healthcare organizations to expand care into the home. Our goal at Current Health is to help our partners design, launch, and scale safe and effective care at home programs. We do this across the entire health space, from community health systems like Baptist Health to research organizations like Mount Sinai. One of our largest customers is the Defense Health Agency, and we also work with global pharmaceutical companies on both the commercial and research side. And here's kind of a snapshot of how we help healthcare organizations achieve those outcomes. We provide a clear window into a patient's condition in the home and bring together an ecosystem of different assets to help care teams engage with them and deliver the best care possible in the patient's home. Our platform combines our proprietary monitoring device with additional connective devices and patient reported data, and then displays those insights into a user-friendly dashboard, which includes tools for patient engagement, virtual care, and in-home services. We also integrate with the healthcare organization's EHR. So the EHR always serves as the source of truth, and we help healthcare organizations to streamline their providers' workflows so that they have a seamless experience on how they use the current health platform with their EHR to provide patients care in their homes. Our aim is to help healthcare organizations fill any gaps they may have to provide an awesome end-to-end -end healthcare at home experience. So now that everyone knows what Current Health does, let's start by talking about a few trends that have been coming together over the last several years that have propelled the drive to, to moving more healthcare into the home. And you know, we have to start by talking about um, you know, everyone's favorite topic, the COVID-19 pandemic because COVID-19 was really a catalyst for a structural change in healthcare delivery. It challenged organizations with determining new ways to deliver safe and effective care outside the four walls of the hospital and pushed care models out of traditional facilities and into patients' homes. For example, we saw that many patients were deferring care and hospitals were suspending elective procedures. This meant that these patients' conditions needed to be monitored. Without monitoring, they could become sicker with more severe conditions requiring emergency care, which in turn increases the cost of care. So hospitals quickly began seeing the value of hospital at home programs that help reduce the cost of care while also maintaining high quality delivery of care. But it wasn't just patients' needs that were driving these changes. There were other compelling forces at work as well. Healthcare organizations were faced with having to support an increasingly aging population that's unfortunately getting sicker and supporting them with constrained capacity. 80% of seniors now have chronic conditions, 80%. And unfortunately, the market data is telling us that this will only get worse in the coming decades. Healthcare organizations are also faced with staffing shortages and burnout. A critical shortage of 3.2 million healthcare workers is expected in the next few years. There's also increasing competition for patient loyalty. 61% of patients say they prefer receiving care in their homes versus in a hospital. I mean, you know, no one really likes going to the hospital after all. And so what this means is that healthcare organizations now need to compete at a whole different level than before. And finally, healthcare organizations are facing incredible pressures to reduce costs while also increasing revenue. And care at home models can help with both. Healthcare organizations have enjoyed a 38% reduction in the cost of acute care at home versus the hospital. So with care moving increasingly into the home, what have the results been? Well, the people have spoken and they love it. A survey released by Moving Health Home, uh, which is a coalition of healthcare organizations advocating for improved access to home-based care, reported that 73% of patients surveyed were confident in the quality of care that they would receive in the home. 88% of them who received home-based care were satisfied and 85% were recommended to a friend or family member. And here's a quote at the top of the slide there from a patient that we've heard firsthand. I would say that the quality of care I got from got at home was superior, far superior. It's, it's a wonderful world being at home. Yeah, it's just amazing to hear. The fact is patients much prefer being at home, receiving care in their homes in comfortable surroundings where they are supported and surrounded by their loved ones. And they would prefer to continue using virtual care services in the future. Now, I don't mind sharing with you that our team has done ride-alongs with our customers, with their nursing staffs, and 
we've seen patients literally grab their arms, you know, emo- getting very emotional, thanking them for this, for the, for the, for the service that it's changed their lives. And that's really powerful stuff. So, so patients love it. What about providers? Well, it turns out they like it too. Here's a quote from a clinical coordinator for a hospital at home program. Our our team of nurses say they have never been thanked so much for the work they're doing. They actually love their jobs again. That's amazing. They were leaving the bricks and mortar exhausted and burned out. I think this is just such a wonderful way for people to continue their nursing career in a whole different way. I mean, it's just awesome, isn't it? And what about outcomes? Well, here's a third quote. This one from a director of a program at a healthcare organization. He says, we had a 20 to 30% drop in 30 day readmission rates, strong clinical outcomes related to deep vein thrombosis and infections that can be acquired in a hospital setting and lower rates of discharge to skilled nursing facilities. So it's just, it's just incredible. So let's talk about what it takes to deliver care at home. <clears throat> now, as a technology leader, you're chartered with bringing together the technology and systems infrastructure and a user experience that can deliver the operational, financial, and clinical value that an organization is seeking. When we apply this mandate to new care models like care at home, suddenly we're confronted with a new set of challenges that don't necessarily exist when delivering care to a patient who is directly in front of you. Delivering care at home requires an end-to-end ecosystem of services, solutions, and integrated technology. In particular, it means bringing together a unique set of technology assets, accessibility and connectivity, integrated data collection and use, enterprise interoperability, and telehealth and communications. These are the areas where you, as your uh, organization's technology and information systems leader, have a direct impact in designing and developing an effective care at home program. Now we've spoken with CIOs and uh, technology leaders across many healthcare organizations and three themes keep coming up as to what they see as their mandates for delivering care at home. One is interoperability. 95% of physicians surveyed say increased data interoperability will improve patient outcomes and 96% agree that easier access to critical data can save lives. So as new data sources are identified and new workflows are designed, we need to think about how to make these how to make these interoperable with our existing systems. Second is usability. We talked earlier about how much patients prefer and like uh, the care at home experience versus the hospital. Now that's only possible with a great usability, a great user experience. The bottom line is that the patient experience has to be good, you know, the best really. And finally, cybersecurity. 48% of hospitals had a forced or proactive shutdown due to a cybersecurity attack. 95% have experienced a data breach. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I say we have to safeguard cybersecurity. So we'll we'll be talking about that in a moment. So interoperability, usability, cybersecurity. Let's explore each one of these in turn. And let's start with interoperability. Now we talked earlier about how the need for interoperability is greater than ever before. From a clinical and patient care standpoint, the goal of interoperability is to empower providers with a holistic view into a patient's health. And this means ensuring that they have the right data at their fingertips at the right time and designing clinical pathways and workflows that are standardized and help drive efficiencies in how they're able to do their jobs. In other words, when we talk about interoperability from a clinical perspective, it's not just about moving data from one system to another, It's actually about the use of standardized clinical pathways and operational workflows to deliver that care. From a technology standpoint, the goal is to maximize the value of your EHR, because after all, you've invested a lot, right, in implementing an EHR. So you need to make sure integrations and data exchanges with your EHR are not just driving technology efficiencies, but also creating real operational and clinical value across your organization. Now, integrating with an EHR is typically a very uh, resource-intensive process. And this is true not only for someone like a care at home solutions provider, but also very much the case for healthcare organizations. For example, you know, first the clinical team will need to outline the desired workflow, then a VPN or general connectivity will need to be established between the two platforms. Then you'll need to identify the data transmission method and frequency and on and on and on. Historically, this has meant that healthcare organizations need to devote considerable resources to the project to ensure representation from EHR analysts, project managers, clinicians, 
and others for each piece of the project. But in the last few years, some of this has begun to change. There have been impressive advances recently in integration methods. Standards like HL7 and FHIR have really made integrations a lot easier. And any integration partner in any care and home platform needs to be able to support multiple standards and interfaces. But when we think about this, there's really three main objectives we need to look at. One, bringing health data into the HR. The HR needs to continue to serve as the single source of truth for patient health. We need to make sure clinical and patient data from all other systems can be seamlessly brought into the HR so care teams can view and manage population and patient data from the EHR itself. Two, implementing embedded experiences within the EHR to streamline the provider's workflow. We wanna maintain the EHR as the preferred system and integrate the user experience from other platforms. What's cool about this is that it allows you to extend the capabilities of the EHR beyond the hospital with a relatively light lift. And three, integrating care coordination events and tasks to create more efficient workflows. So things like integrating enrollment and scheduling tasks, alarming capabilities, actionable biometrics data, things like that. At Current Health, our product innovation specific to EHR interoperability has been around developing our platform to be a complementary one to the EHR and to streamline workflows for providers and care teams that would be working with both systems to deliver care in the home. So how does all this come together? Well, so here on this slide is a visual representation of a patient's journey through a care at home program. We can identify specific points throughout this journey where interoperability can be used to not only automate how the patient moves through the different steps in their journey, but also embed care at home practices into existing workflows within your EHR. So your providers can continue to operate within their preferred system of use. Furthermore, we can look at what data can be exchanged between a care at home platform and your EHR to ensure a seamless experience for both patients and providers, while also enriching the data within your systems and reducing administrative burdens on the care team. Looking at the gaps between the native functionality of an EHR and a care at home ecosystem allows you to identify those data elements that are needed to construct an effective care at home program. So going from right, excuse me, going from left to right, starting with intake. This step is about having the right pathways to refer and identify the right patients to receive care at home. So from an interoperability standpoint, we see opportunities for including inclusion exclusion criteria in the patient intake form sent to the EHR and order requests for patient admission and enrollment. And speaking of enrollment, this step is about enrolling patients with integrated order management and logistics. So we wanna think about data elements like unique patient identifiers, patient demographics and other information. The monitoring phase there in the middle is all about integrating health data from multiple sources to provide a holistic and complete picture of the patient's health. So we wanna think about data elements like continuous and intermittent readings from different biometric devices, as well as patient self-reported data, aggregating all that data and sending it back to flow sheets within the EHR. Risk assessment and intervention is all about having real-time alerts generated from data-driven alarms so the care team can perform appropriate interventions as necessary. So here we wanna think about data elements related to alarms, escalations, and clinical notes. Then the care team is also thinking about ordering and managing in-home clinical services to deliver diagnostics and therapeutics into the home. So here we wanna think about order management and logistics of those in-home clinical services. And finally, when the patient is ready to be discharged or transferred to the next level of care, we wanna think about the data elements related to order requests for discharge and transfer. But this slide goes just a little bit deeper to see examples of the type of information that can be shared between a care at home platform and the EHR. The important piece to highlight here is the bi-directional nature of the integration. Information must be, must be shared between both systems to ensure the integration is effective. This includes workflows that not only involve data exchange, but also those that provide a seamless user experience between the care at home platform and the EHR. So for example, using capabilities like Smart on Fire to embed the care at home platform's user experience, for example, within the EHR and using deep linking to launch it with, excuse me, <clears throat> to launch it with patient and clinical context. In this relationship throughout, the EHR is always seen as the source of truth. Although many report, remote patient monitoring solutions out there will collect their own data, 
The EHR is where that data is meant to live. Now, of course, the EHR must also have the ability to interface with third-party platforms to send order requests, clinical summaries, and things like that. But it is the assumed responsibility of the care at home platform to collect and transmit data cleanly back to the EHR. The platform should provide the architecture to stand up an ecosystem of care delivery in the home that can be plugged into working alongside the EHR. Zooming back out, interoperability has another benefit of allowing you to more purposefully design your care at home workflows to leverage best of breed systems while still maintaining data integrity and continuity. Today, the HR is not really purposeful, purposefully built to manage real-time patient data from the home. For example, what you see here, this is our clinical dashboard. And you can see how much is going on in just a single morning of a patient's care at home. We're pulling in continuous data that is showing 15-minute increments, as well as intermittent blood pressure and weight data. We also have patient-reported surveys on things like metadarence and self-reported symptoms. All of this needs to be shown in a single easy to view dashboard with alarms that help clinicians know when to act and how. For real-time management of those patients, our platform is great, but we also recognize the need to have a centralized holistic view of the patient's health, which is why any care at home platform must have multiple ways to put that data back into the HR. So for starters, order sets. An order is placed within the HR. As an order is placed, modified, or canceled, there needs to be a trigger to provision and deliver a kit. In other words, the, bio, the set of biometric devices and supporting peripherals to the patient's home or to the bedside if the kit is being delivered at discharge. Then there's clinical context information. A clinical summary query needs to be initiated to the EHR to obtain the patient's clinical summary. This will include things like demographics, shipping details, past medical history, this then needs to be presented to the care manager interface to ensure clinical context is available when reviewing health data and alarms. Then there are observations and symptoms. The care at home platform needs to be able to transfer observation and symptoms and ORU, ORU messages into the HR. And finally, alarms. Alarms can be sent in near real time or as scheduled transmissions to the HR. This can be done by flagging flow sheet values as abnormal with annotations, and then the EHR can use rules to route to inboxes like, you know, for example, with an Epic in-basket. Alarm thresholds can always be monitored at the, uh, excuse me, can always be modified rather at the individual patient level. So that covers interoperability. Now, let me turn it over to Matt to talk about another important factor to the success of a care at home program, usability. Thank you so much, Shuttle. Um, and just to echo Shuttle, it's a real pleasure to speak to you all today. Thank you for making the time. And I think um, what Shuttle has been alluding to in, in the first part of this talk with interoperability is essentially breaking down some of the barriers to help facilitate adoption of this technology, because I think we're quite realistic in current health that when we, we know that when we bring technology in the care at home model to new organizations there's a certain degree of, of, of skepticism and inertia that there is in any organization that needs to be overcome and having the kind of seamless technology interoperability that Shadow was talking about is one step but the other thing really is usability in the user experience how this is reflected in the eyes of the practitioners and patients who are using the tech um, next slide thanks Shadow. So we have to deliver a better experience than the status quo. This has to be something that is enticing for people to use. First and foremost, we're in healthcare. So we have to make sure that our user experience enables providers to deliver safe and effective care. Um, we're very conscious of the digital divide and in generally the, the spectrum of, um, of opportunity that exists across our society. And we need to make sure that um, patients have um, equitable access to this technology, that we meet patients where they are and that it can accommodate their unique needs. And fundamentally, we want it to be a satisfying and enjoyable experience for people to use. And we think if we can meet these goals um, and keep improving and iterating on them, then that will definitely facilitate the adoption of, of the tech. Um, next slide, thanks, Shadow. And part of the reason why this adoption is um, a challenge to um, kind of be worked through is because care at home does require a paradigm shift. We can't think of it as sort of hospital care light. Um, 
for example, these are some of the challenges that, that are faced by, um, by practitioners who are trying to conduct this work day to day. They have to be able to access patients' data. They have to be able to document what they've done, and they've got to be able to do that from either a clinical command centre or from the patient's home. They have to adapt the way they round on patients. We talk about digital dashboard rounds. Um, they have to be able to detect deterioration early because the patient is less accessible. And they also have to be able to manage large volumes of patients. And then they have to be able to escalate care if um, something goes wrong. And there's an interesting tension between detecting deterioration early, providing lots of information and managing large volume of patients. And that tension is expressed through triage. We have to set alarms that are not just sensitive, like in a hospital, so a threshold is breached and the alarm goes bing and someone can open a patient's door and check on them. We, they also need to be specific because the patient's at home, you can't just open their door, you might have to call them and disturb them or send an ambulance. So we have to provide this capability to meet all these challenges and we have to set things up in a way that is kind of different and suitable for care at home, but also familiar. So it doesn't feel like such a big learning curve for practitioners. Um, next slide thing, Shadow. So if you look at our dashboard, for example, that um, Shadow's shown before, um, you can see that in the center, there's the kind of um, familiar chart view, tabular view that healthcare providers would be used to seeing in a patient's chart. So instantly there's an element of the familiar. We try to, bucket our vital signs. We try to aggregate them over 15 minutes. And the reason we do that is because in a hospital, patients, when they're observed, they tend to sit still and behave themselves. At home, people climb stairs, they make cups of coffee, they go about their activities of daily living. And so what we have to do is compensate for that added activity and that added physiological variability in an interface that is still familiar and that enable providers to use their usual heuristics in deciding what to do with the patient. We've got to be smart about our alarms and we've got to make them configurable to individual patients. But again, it comes back down to interoperability because we need to give people context for those alarms. So we need to bring in EHR data and enough that people can make good decisions. And we need to be able to write back to the EHR so we have a permanent record of what decisions were made. Next slide, thanks, Shadow. And this can feel like a bit of a stepping stone for institutions. And so what we try and do is bring these technological elements um, alongside workflow and operational elements into clinical pathways. So when we set up a new pathway with a hospital, we'll think about the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, the kit that people will require, how we should set the alarms, how we should reimburse and bill for this, all of the things that we need as kind of stepping off points for discussion to make sure that a program is well embedded within um, within clinical workflows in a particular institution. Next slide, thing, Shadow. And so that's good on an institutional level, but what if you're a nurse coming to this um, new to the world of, of remote nursing. And so um, we have a, fav a favorite nurse at UMass, which is one of our deployments. This is Andrea. Um, Andrea came to us after uh, working through the first part of the COVID pandemic. And she, in her own words, felt burnt out, dead inside, and she wanted to change. Um, but also in her own words, Andre Andrea would describe herself as technologically challenged. Um, so what we have to, so uh, Andrea, I guess, is, is at the heart of our, our user experience on the provider side. Someone with a great deal of expertise and a great deal of willing to take part in this new mode of care. And we have to make sure that we can train her and also provide an interface that is accessible such that she can do her job. And actually the reason, not that we have favorites, but the reason why we love Andrea is because Andrea is absolutely shone. She not only was able to take on our technology, but she's now become a team leader and she teaches others. And that to us is the greatest sign of a usability success, where someone who would consider themselves challenged can then consider themselves confident to teach other people. Next slide, thanks, Shadow. So we've kind of looked at the dashboard and we've looked at, at the provider experience, the mix of, of the new and with the familiar to make it accessible. How about for patients? 
So we need patients to engage with our technology. So we need them to open the box. We need them to activate it. We need them to wear it. We need them to be adherent. And ultimately, we need the, these two things to drive outcomes. And some of the things that are essential in this are care team communication. You have to prepare the patient for their new mode of care. So that comes down to a little bit of education, a little bit of training, a little bit of pre-warning. And there's a technological element to that as well. You have to be able to let patients know one step ahead um, of what's there to expect in their journey. They need to be supported 24 seven. And this can be a challenge for some institutions. And we run a clinical command center staffed by nurses 24-7, um, 365, that can take on some of that burden. Um, some institutions prefer to set up their own command centers and so we can help them facilitate them through pathways to understand how to give patients constant monitoring. Out of the box usability is essential. A patient has to see this experience as seamless. So when they take out the kit, even if you have peripheral devices mixed in, blood pressure cuffs, weighing scales, all of it has to feel like one seamless experience. And on the technological side, that means making sure that the Bluetooth links, the wireless links, everything function really without the patient being aware of them. We talk about out of the box usability, but actually one of the things we found is that um, patients tend to ignore things unless we put a big stamp on it saying medical for your care. So there's, um, there's in, still in the box usability as an element of that as well. Uh, so the integrated digital front door. So a, a lot of institutions, I'm sure with yours uh, as well, they use, uh, you use things um, like my, um, my chart or in the UK patient knows best, um, PKB, and you train your patients and you get them used to using a particular digital front door or a particular interface. And we recognize this and we don't want to make patients jump through an extra set of hurdles. So we think that it's very important that technology in this context is able to be almost white labeled from a patient's perspective that they can access it through their usual portal. And there's the stuff that is um, widely known, but hugely important around accessibility. Can you see it if you're visually impaired? Are there options if you're hearing impaired? Can we bring in translators into our video calls? And collectively, all of these things we hope will break down barriers and facilitate um, a patient being adherent and engaged. Next slide, thanks, Shada. And this is just an example. This is kind of a complicated slide, but uh, in some ways that's the point. You, we try and meet the patients where they are. So in terms of eliciting information from patients and communicating with them, we have patient surveys, PROs, with a sort of, delivered in a kind of chatbot style um, that can engage with patients regularly to collate, for example, symptom information. We have video calls that can be scheduled and done ad hoc if you're triaging a patient and you need to communicate with them. We have asynchronous communication um, and we also have an I need help button um, in case because patients need to be aware that asynchronous communication may not be answered instantly. And with all of this it comes that burden of, of documentation and audit. Um, and so we try and facilitate that as much as possible. Everything needs to be timestamped. People need to know who's seen what when and all of this needs to be exportable to the EHR. Next slide, thanks. And I think I, I would love to say that we've got all this done and tied up and sewn up, but far from it. Um, this is a constant process uh, for everyone in this kind of new field of study and iteration. And we think we should kind of approach iteration on a few different levels. We should obviously listen to our patients and providers. Um, going through complaints is always a goldmine of things. They obviously don't want to over-rotate on some of them. Um, but also we like to look at uh, in a kind of more rigorous way at usability. So there are lots of validated tools that we find helpful. A particular one is context from a quantitative point of view, it's the telehealth usability questionnaire, but there are also qualitative um, schedules, semi-structured interviews, things that you can use to elicit usability information. And then when you root these insights back into your products and program to go back and look for differences and change. Um, so because this is our webinar, we've picked two quotes that make us look good. Um, but these are some of the things that we get from our interviews when we talk to people, um, what they like about it, a little bit about the patient experience. Um, and this helps us kind of develop and iterate on our product. Um, so that's me on usability. Back to you, Shadil. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Uh, that was a great overview. 
All right, so finally, let's talk about cybersecurity, our third and final topic for today. It's a big one. We could probably spend two hours just talking about cybersecurity. But what we want to talk about here is how moving care outside the four walls of the hospital impacts cybersecurity risks. Now, in a recent survey of CHIME members, safeguarding cybersecurity risks was identified as the number one focus area for 2022. And it's really no wonder. The average healthcare breach cost $9.4 million in 2021. Right? $9.4 million. That's, that's a lot of pennies. So providing care at home introduces some new variables for cybersecurity. And these must be carefully considered when designing a care at home program and on an ongoing basis. For one, the move to remote work situations and access to internal systems. As an example, as part of their home care delivery efforts, the healthcare organization may deploy nurses to visit patients in their homes. Those nurses will be likely carrying laptops and devices from work and then using them to access systems and data from the patient's home, potentially on unsecured home networks. Another aspect is the software supply chain. And we're all familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, we're all familiar with the solar winds hack and the log J4 vulnerability, for example. Zero day vulnerabilities and ransomware are also on the rise. So it's important to not only manage your own software supply chain, but also ensure that third party vendors are doing the same with their own software supply chains. Externally, the use of personal devices presents a new risk front. These could be patients' personal devices, but also increasingly organizations are allowing employees to use their own personal devices to run uh, work-related apps. And finally, with all these third-party systems being used, there is the possibility that patient data could be stored outside the EHR. So when evaluating third-party applications and vendors, the security and reliability of the vendor can be evaluated through the lens of the CIA triad model, which some of you may be, uh, or all of you are probably familiar with, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So let's look at how this applies to security for a care at home platform. So first confidentiality. This is about ensuring that sensitive data and patient health information is protected from unauthorized access. So when exchanging highly sensitive data between a third party application and your EHR and other IT systems, it's important to understand how your data is being stored, encrypted and exchanged. In addition to this, it's important to include any technical assessment questions to determine who from the third party vendor organization would have access to your data and if and what data they limit access to. So for example, when delivering care at home, patients could receive clinical and technical support from an external vendor to ensure they're receiving the best possible care. When looking at the clinical and technical personnel providing that support, it's important to understand what levels of access to the patient data that type of user may have and how they might interact with it. Second, integrity. This is about considering how data is managed or modified within a third-party organization that's exchanging PHI and other health-related information data with your systems. It's important to understand the traceability the vendor has built into their application or platform. With the appropriate security policies, protections, and procedures, data integrity can be protected and made actionable for your care teams to gain deeper clinical and program insights. For example, in order to verify integrity, it's critical to understand the application's protocols to denial of service to prove the origin and integrity of data and protect your network at the point of interoperability. Third, availability. When a third-party vendor, oh, sorry, within a third-party vendor rather, it's important to understand the actual availability of your data. In other words, when access to your data is needed, are you able to access it in the appropriate time frame? When delivering care at home, it's important that patient data and vitals are transmitting to the care at home platform or pass directly into your EHR swiftly to make sure your patients are safely cared for. So platforms and applications need high availability to ensure that any volume of patients can be supported through network outages and secure network connections in the event of failure. It's also critical to understand what level of disaster recovery and redundancy the third party application has in place to ensure the availability of data and service. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that when we think about enterprise-wide security, we need to take an expansive approach that takes into consideration not just the systems, but also the people. And this extends to the care at home platform too. So let's go through some of these key considerations. So first of all, limited access and traceability. This is important as more and more organizations roll out enterprise authentication and authorization and SSO 
using standards like SAML and OAuth. Key things to consider here are role-based access controls and audit trails. Implementing an SEIM tool gives you the benefits of data aggregation and normalization, as well as incident detection and visibility across your entire IT environment. Second, verified device access. This is accomplished through context-aware device access. So implementing mobile device management or even more broadly enterprise mobility management, which is especially important in BYOD type situations, bring your own device scenarios that we talked about earlier. An effective MDM platform helps keep all devices secure while keeping the workforce flexible and productive. Third, authentication management. So I mentioned standards like OAuth and SAML integrations for single sign-on and to verify against existing user credentials and for delegated authorization. Now, there are, there are many other security protocols that are available today, especially for mobile devices, right? For example, banking apps make heavy use of security provisions like two-factor authentication, authenticator apps, tokens and pins, biometric security pro protocols like facial recognition or iris recognition, fingerprints, those kinds of things. But now remember, Matt also just now talked about the importance of the user experience. So ultimately, you need to balance the need for security against usability here. So on the one hand, we could implement all these security provisions, but then we may risk users seeing these as barriers to usability especially elderly folks or less tech savvy patients. So, you know, if we just have them go security provision through security provision, they may see this as too many hops to go through just to access the app. This may cause them to abandon the app or maybe not even enroll in the first place. And that's gonna cause your activation and adherence metrics to just tank. And nobody wants that. But on the other hand, we can't not implement any security provisions, right? So, you know, if we implement too few, we expose ourselves to serious security vulnerabilities. So it's definitely a balancing act to be sure. You need to approach this very thoughtfully and you wanna work with a vendor who has approached it just as thoughtfully. Fourth, software supply chain, which I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so increasing interoperability reduces the total number of systems required for users to act access, which of course users like. However, this does create a headache for technology leaders because now there are a multitude of systems to be concerned about, many of which are third-party systems you have little control over. So it's important to not only manage your own software supply chain, but also understand how your vendors are managing theirs. For example, they should be cataloging and maintaining an inventory of all libraries being used in their platform. They should be tracking risks and vulnerability updates across these. They should have the procedures in place and a track record of responding quickly to updates as they're available. For example, sending um, automated notifications to engineers when there's an update to the library, things like that. Fifth, business continu continuity, excuse me, business conti continuity and redundancies. Apparently it's a hard word for me to say. This is about ensuring the right policies, protocols, and procedures are in place in the event a breach occurs. And of course, ensuring high availability and failover. A big part of this is ensuring there's a process to keep apps and systems up to date and that those are being followed. And finally, internal policies, procedures, and training. So like I said earlier, we have to keep in mind the people side of this. Now, since I'm speaking to an audience of tech people, I think I can safely say that most people who are not on the tech side see cybersecurity as a technology problem, right? You know, something the CIO or IT or the security department needs to worry about. It's not really my problem, right? But as we all well know, the fact is that security is everyone's problem, everyone's responsibility. And education is paramount here. For example, at Current Health, every single employee, including our CEO, goes through mandatory cybersecurity compliance training. And this goes beyond, this kind of training goes beyond just, you know, hey, have strong passwords, right? This is about things like, you know, make sure that you lock your computer and your phone. Don't leave your phone or sensitive information lying around. Don't open suspicious emails. You know, verify emails from the sender if it looks sketchy. You know, if, you know, use the corporate VPN to connect to internal networks, you know, things like that. Basically, it's about instilling a culture of security within the organization and expecting the same from your care and home platform provider. So putting all this together, when working with vendors, be it a care at home platform provider or really any vendor uh, for that matter, you kind of want to adopt the policy of trust, but verify. From an interoperability standpoint, you want to consider the type of data being passed between your EHR and the vendor's platform, where this data is going to be stored, how, I, excuse me, how identity management and access will be managed. 
From a security standpoint, you want to evaluate vendors on a number of dimensions that we've talked about today. For example, I talked about the training that we go through at Kern Health. We're also FDA regulated. And as a Best Buy Health company, we have a 140 person strong technical and infosec team that is dedicated to security and reliability. So in effect, any vendor should be able to clearly articulate to you their security posture, and they should be able to demonstrate that they have a culture of security in addition to the policies and procedures and things like that. And this stuff becomes really important because, you know, frankly, you don't just want a vendor. You, you want a partner who will collaborate with your security team. You know, do things like providing proactive communications, vendors who do that, provide proactive communications to their customers, you know, proving their ability to resolve issues quickly in partnership with your security team. This would even include having a philosophy of building security considerations early into their own design and development processes. For example, using encrypted storage, right? Like, you know, mobile devices today have secure storage that can be leveraged. So has their app been designed to leverage that? You know, those sort of considerations. So we, we just went through a lot, I know. <laughs> we covered a lot. So let me summarize and then We'll pause for, for questions. Let me summarize some of the key takeaways from our discussion today. So taking a step back, technology leaders like you have an enormous and incredibly important role to play in the success of a care at home program. You really do have a big influence on its outcomes. And today we talked about three key factors that can impact the success of a care at home program and that you have a direct control over. Interoperability, usability, and cybersecurity. With regard to interoperability, we have to remember interoperability is beyond just data exchange. From a clinical standpoint, the goal is to empower providers with a holistic view into a patient's health, with the EHR, of course, always seen as the ultimate source of truth. From a technology standpoint, the goal is to maximize the value of your investment in the EHR. In that regard, we talked about three core objectives, right? Bringing health data into the EHR, implementing embedded experiences within the EHR to streamline your provider's workflows, and integrating care coordination events and tasks to create more efficient workflows for them. On the usability front, Matt talked about how product usability alongside your EHR has an enormous impact on the adoption of your care at home program, and that the patient experience, satisfaction, and program adherence is driven by product usability. And finally, on cybersecurity, you wanna take an enterprise-wide approach that includes the systems, processes, and people. And that extends equally to your care at home platform provider or really, frankly, any vendor that you work with. And you wanna evaluate the, those vendors on their security posture and their culture of security that goes beyond just having the standards, you know, security certifications. In other words, do they really walk the talk and they, would they truly be a partner to you? As an example, Consider evaluating them through the lens of the CIA triad model, uh, which can be a useful framework just to get started, things like that. 